Well, hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Let Love Begin podcast. Today I'm speaking with Lisa Shield. Lisa is a love, dating and heart opening expert with 19 years of experience. Lisa shares her story today of how she was dating and how what she was doing wasn't really working. She came out of a relationship. It wasn't working for her. She did a lot of work and then she put that work into action. We're going to talk about what she did, how all the things she learned came together for her and what ended up working for her. She also dated a lot of people to find the person that she's currently in a relationship with. And it was very interesting to hear uh, her methodology and how that worked for her. As with all of the Let Love Begin podcasts, I urge you to listen to your own inner compass and see if the advice given in this episode is something that resonates with you. But if it does, be brave, move forward. If it doesn't, move on to the next. Thanks for listening. This is Let Love Begin, a podcast for the recovering brokenhearted, ready to heal and reclaim their enthusiasm. Well, hey there, it's Talia here. And I wanted to let you know that I started this podcast when I went through my most significant breakup. And what really helped me at the time was listening to other people's stories of healing and how they transformed through their breakup. That really helped me understand what I was going through and really gave me help that I could get there too. Before this podcast, I created an online summit where I interviewed 21 experts talking about different aspects of breakups and how we can let go of our ex and begin to open our hearts again. It's called the Let Love Begin Summit. And if you're interested in watching or listening to the summit, you can go to rebellove.com forward slash summit and use the code podcast for 20% off. It's usually just $21, which is a dollar per interview, but you can get it for around 16-ish using the code podcast. I hope you get as much out of it as I got making it. Okay, back to the episode. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. I'm really excited to have this conversation. I, Before we get started, though, I want to know, tell us a little bit about your story about how you became a love and dating and heart opening expert. Well, I went through a terrible marriage. I spent 13 years with the wrong man. And I came out of that marriage. He, in retrospect, was a pathological liar And I looked at my life and I said, you know, relationships are too important, no matter how well everything else is going. If you're not in a relationship or not in the right relationship, it's awful. And it casts, you know, a dark cloud over everything. And I said, Lisa, you don't have 13 more years to waste. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I was going to get this solved. It became the single most important thing in my life. So I did a ton of self-help work. I worked with some very well-known teachers and mentors. The most known was Don Miguel Ruiz, who wrote The Four Agreements. Mm -hmm. Love that book. And yeah, I got my master's in spiritual psychology and Many, many, many years of self-work and self-reflection didn't get this solved. And so I decided when I was turning 40 that I was going to solve it. And I said, Lisa, you can sit on a therapist's sofa for more years, or you can read more self-help books, or, you know, sit and analyze this ad nauseum with your girlfriends, Mm -hmm. Or you can just start dating and applying everything you've learned. And it took me 95 first dates over two years. Uh, They were all internet dates. And the 96th date, I met the love of my life for the man I call the guardian of my soul. And he was the one who said, After three months of knowing me, he said, you should be a therapist or a coach. Okay. I have a couple of questions about this. When you say internet dating, do you mean that they were like video calls or like you met them online? Online dating. Like, like at the time that I dated over 20 years ago, Mm -hmm. there were only websites like JDate and Match.com and Matchmaker Match. There were just a handful of online dating sites. And I met my husband on J-Date. I decided because I'm Jewish, I'm not religious. I don't go to temple. I don't even know when the holidays are. But I wanted to meet a man. I thought, you know, the best match for me would be 
somebody who had at least some Jewish background. So I went on J-Date and I think my instincts were right. I, I'm not religious at all, but being with somebody who was raised culturally Jewish was a great match for me. How did you know that he was the person for you after 95 dates? <laughs> so my husband is truly the most remarkable human being I've ever met. And by that time, I wasn't looking for superficial things. I was really looking much deeper, much, you know, below, more below the surface of things. And so when I met Benjamin, he actually was 30 minutes late for our date. And he called me. He let me know he was he had gotten lost on the way to the date. But when he walked in, he I was sitting down and he was very calm because he is, at least on the outside. <laughs> and he walked in and he took my hand in both of his and he looked directly in my eyes. And he said, it is so nice to meet you. And he just held my gaze. And in that moment, I thought, oh, my God, this is the kindest human being I have ever met. And he sat down across from me. He did, never broke that energy the entire time. He was completely present with me. Eckhart Tolle doesn't have a thing on this guy. <laughs> my husband is the master of being in the present moment and being present. He's amazing. And I just thought, wow, I have no idea if this will go anywhere or if it did, you know, will we even really click on important things? But I knew he was extraordinary. And he is. And, and with, I love hearing that story, by the way, it's very nice. It's nice hearing when people, well, first of all, when you meet someone who is really in the present, it's very um, mm -hmm. rare, but also such a privilege to be around someone who's kind of harnessed their way of being that you notice it immediately. Okay. So let, let's back up a little bit prior to that. When you said you had 95 dates before you met your husband, were they only one day each? Yeah, there were only two second dates. Right. Just two. And you just knew. So you wanted to move through them quickly because you just knew that it wasn't going to go anywhere. Well, a lot of it had to do, you know, what people don't understand about why I went on 95 first dates. I wasn't agonizing. I wasn't like, oh, my God, this sucks. And, you know, I can't believe him and whatever. I really was in a place where I, I don't know how to explain this to people because I think people think, oh, well, I feel that way or whatever. But there's a difference between getting something intellectually and really being in that state of beingness. So when I was dating, I had had a meditation. I was in a meditation meeting. In this meditation, I realized that unconditional love is real. Like, it's real. Most, most spiritual paths are leading us to God or unconditional love. I'm getting a little metaphysical here, but for anybody who's listening who really has a very heart-centered or spiritual approach to life, I think they'll understand what I'm saying, that all, almost all spiritual paths are leading us to God, how to you know connect with God, which is, in my mind, synonymous with unconditional love. God is pure love. And when I realized that this existed, I came out of the meditation and I said, oh, my God, this is real. Like, this isn't a dream. It's not a, you know, I always thought it was something you strived for, but you would never actually attain, right? You would always be reaching for it, but that you had to be a perfect person, an ascended being, right? Like a master to be able to have that kind of pure love and acceptance with another person. But once I realized, no, we can have this in the here and now, I asked myself, how do you do that? Like, how do you attract unconditional love? And I reverse engineered it. And what I realized was that in order to receive or to to think that somebody 
could reciprocate, I had to first be willing to give it. So most people, the mistake that they're making when they're dating is they're going on dates and they have this list of criteria and they're sitting there saying, well, does he match me? And how much money does he make? And what's his job? And, you know, right. And they're like trying to see if this person fits all this criteria. Well, I was going on dates and my question was, could I love and accept this man exactly the way he is? Is there anything I would really not be okay with? Would I want to fix him or change him or whatever? And I just sat back and I would sit across from these men. And, you know, I might meet some incredible men. I dated lawyers and doctors and producers. I was in Los Angeles, film directors and all kinds of interesting people. But what I started to see was they didn't have the level of consciousness that I was really seeking. They weren't embodied. They weren't living their lives at that level of awareness of consciousness. And I could sit across from somebody very quickly and tell if they were aligned or they were misaligned. So you trusted your intuition and you just moved forward if it didn't work. I love that. Yep. And I also knew I'd get out of something immediately. I have no trouble saying, you know what, this was great, but it, you know, it's not going to work for me. Right. In that, in the dating of the 95 people, I love, I love that you explained that by the way of the kind of the level of awareness and knowing I, I know what you mean. I've dated a lot and you can tell very quickly. You can tell very quickly how much work someone's done on themselves by how they respond to things and also how present they're able to be. In in the dating of the 95 people, was there any sense of urgency? Did you have children? Did you want to have children? No, I never wanted children. And it was really one of the you know connection points between my husband and me was that I didn't have children and I really was clear I didn't want them. And I will tell you in this day and age in this world, I am so grateful that I didn't. I really am. I wouldn't, you know, knowing what I know, I wouldn't bring, I wouldn't have children today. Even if I wanted them, I wouldn't have them. So it took some pressure off that I didn't want children. But the, you know, the the other part of that is a lot of my clients who don't have children also judge themselves for not having children and they think that that's going to make them less desirable to men who have them so uh, you know we can create a story around anything i can say that it made it easier for me but some people think it makes it harder for me it just took all the pressure off because i didn't have a time clock so you're able to just date freely like in any age You know, you're just looking, you Mm -hmm. just know what you want more, I guess. Yeah. And I knew I could take my time and find the right person. I mean, that was another thing. I wasn't rushing into anything with anyone, nothing. And if somebody pushed or they were anxious, first of all, I'm not the kind of person that invites that. So Mm -hmm. people don't get far with me with that. It just doesn't, you know, I don't, I'm not a, an invitation for people to do that, if that makes sense. They just can tell very quickly that I'm not going to go down that road with them. So I didn't engage a lot of that. So I think that's also partly why I moved so quickly through those dates was because I just wasn't going to engage at that level. I did when I was younger. Don't get me wrong. I had plenty of that, but not at this point. Okay. I, I really like kind of the scenario where you've painted a very specific picture of, let's say from somebody in their, you know, 35 plus, who's very clear that they want to be in a relationship. What, what do you find when clients come to you and work with you? What do you think is the kind of biggest roadblock? Well, there's a difference between what I feel the roadblock is and what they think it is. So what they tell me it is, Talia, is they will say to me, they can't find quality men on their level who want to date them, right? That they just, where are all the quality men? And my answer to them is, well, let's don't talk about all the quality men. Let's talk about the 1% of men who you were really interested in, who you wanted a second date from, and who you never heard from again. And the men that we connect with, 
they're going to be few and far between no matter what. I mean, you, I could put you in a room full of so-called quality men who have great jobs. They're good looking, they're fit and whatever. And you may only find one or two guys in that room that you really have rapport with and you have commonality. So those men are out there, but the women are because what I know is the issue, they're not attractive. They're not attractive to those men. And attraction is a very, very crucial part of this puzzle that gets missed because most of what we know is how to flirt, how to play games, how to like get the guy or get to I do, or how do I write the perfect text that's going to get him to respond? These are all superficial strategies. So we know it doesn't matter if you're, you know, in the 99 percentile of, you know, beautiful people on the planet, you're going to naturally get more attention. But if you look around, some of the most beautiful women on the planet have the worst relationships, right? So looks and beauty and youth and success, all of those things are lovely, but they don't create lasting love. That's true. So let's just, before we move forward anymore, let's just define attraction in the context of this specific conversation. Well, what do you think attraction is? Talk to me what you think attraction is. Well, for me, I mean, I, I'm going to go back to what you said before about that level of awareness. For me, that's attractive. I mean, I'm at the stage mm-hmm. where looks is not high on my list. Like, obviously, I want to be sexually attracted to the person I'm in a relationship with. But that doesn't always equal, oh, this is the best looking person in the room. I think if I'm going to, I'm at the stage where if I choose someone for their looks, I've made the wrong choice, you know, as I'm looking for somebody who's internally attractive, which means that they can be present. I find that attractive. Uh, Their behavior matches their words. To me, that's Mm -hmm. attractive. They can have a conversation in a calm way and be honest in a respectful way. I find that attractive. So for me, attraction might mean something different to somebody else. I'm not so worried personally in my life if a man's got lots of money, but I do, I am interested in their drive. So I don't care if you make tons of money and you're some whatever, you've got some whatever huge job. If you're passionate about something and you've got drive and you're dedicated to that cause, even if it doesn't make a lot of money, to me that's attractive. You know, I make my own money. (laughs) I don't, you know, I don't. I don't want a man for their money. I, w- I always said, you know, I, I don't need a man to take care of me financially. I do need him to take care of himself. I'm, I'm sure shit not going to be anyone's joker mama. <laughs> that, that's unattractive to me. So that that those are a few things that I find attractive. But I'm interested to, to hear in what you mean in this conversation. Yeah, so that's all fabulous. And I love what you just said. I'm going to take a little bit of a twist on that, right? So I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball there. If you had asked me, what do I think is attractive? I would have talked about the things that I need to bring to the table. I would have talked about who I need to be in order to attract the men that I want to bring into my world. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about what is attractive, I'm interested in the part that I have control over and that I can actually do something about. Of course. So for me, and what I think most women are missing, and I want to really say something to all of your listeners. I coach women. I'm not coaching men. If I were coaching men, I would be telling them what they could do differently, Right. right? I would be talking to men and saying, This is what you need to do. So I don't want anybody to think listening to this, that I'm just stigmatizing women and saying, we have to make all the changes. Right. I'm telling you that if you want to be attractive to the kinds of men, Benjamin could have walked into that date and he could have sat down in front of me and there could have been, I could have blown it. I could have blown it. So for me, being an attractive woman means that I understand 
male psychology. I can put myself in a man's shoes Mm -hmm. and I can think about the things that men are looking for in the kinds of women that they respect, that they admire, women who own their sensuality, Mm -hmm. women who are comfortable with a man making a sexual move and don't get all bent out of shape even if she's not ready to kiss the guy or she doesn't want to hold his hand or she's not ready to go, you know, to his house for dinner. It is important that we understand how easily men are shamed, Mm. how easily they are emasculated by us. I don't care who it is. The male ego is really quite, it's quite delicate. You can build a man up and make him feel like a god, a hero, a king, or you can shoot him down with with a single look or a single sentence. And so being a safe place to land, being the kind of woman who understands men and who they are, you know, understands male sexuality, I mean... Sexuality for men is very different than it is for women. And most women are so deeply insecure that we really manipulate men sexually. Now, men take advantage of women too. They manipulate us. Don't get me wrong. But there are many, many, many women who do not understand how men think sexually when it comes to sex. And they want to kind of put a lid on them. They want to control them. They want to keep, you know, they want to get their their claws in them and whatever. And if they're out, let's say a woman, you know, an insecure woman is out with a guy and he's even nice to the waitress. You know, he's just being a little like ordering his food and he's a little nice to the waitress that can trigger a woman's insecurity And you better believe a a guy like Benjamin, if we were on a date and I got insecure because I felt like he was flirting with the waitress at dinner or something, that I there would have been no second or third date. Does that make sense? So it's being mature, it's being feminine, it's being an adult, it's being able to ask for what you want and need from a man without playing games or you know, mind games or guessing games. There's so many things that women just don't know about how to build connection and rapport with men. And that's why these men are not paying attention to them. Mm. Interesting. It's an interesting perspective. I um, hmm. I wonder about women hearing that though and then thinking that they need to pander to men's egos instead of be who they are boy you sure just you don't want to support a guy how many women expect a man to pay for dinner how many women expect a man to plan a date how many women expect a man to fill in the blanks how many women who make six figures wouldn't hesitate to let their husband or their boyfriend take them on a vacation or pay for whatever. They're not pulling out their credit cards. How many women expect a man to say, you're beautiful? There's so many expectations that we have, but it's really important that we ask ourselves, what am I bringing to the table? What do I ha- what am I offering other than I went and got my hair and nails done and I showed up so you could buy me dinner and prove and ch- and I can check off the boxes to see if you're a match for me. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think that question of what can I bring to the table is really relevant for everyone and I know you did preface that by saying you're talking to women um and you coach women but I think that's a really important for anyone dating, you know, m- men, women, they them, whoever what am I bringing to the table? Okay. And, and I mean, I totally agree. You can only be responsible for yourself and who you are. And that's why it's important to do the work. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about 
you, you mentioned before that you did you did a lot of work, but none of it was kind of really getting where you wanted to go. But then you said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, so correct me if I'm wrong. You said, I put it all into action. And I started dating. So what were those things that you put into action specifically? Obviously, we're talking about the things we can control, which is ourselves. So what changed in the way you were dating? It's a great question. So much of the work that we do, Talia, it's all generic self-help work, right? It's self-improvement. And the idea that I had, and I think a lot of people have, is that we are going to self-improve, right? I just kept thinking... I'm going to become the best version of me. And then the guys are just going to be lining up to date me because I'm so fabulous. But what none of those, those, those programs gave me was that way of connecting with men, that rapport. And what I knew was I had never seen a relationship that I wanted myself personally. I had never seen a woman who interacted with men in a way that I admired and wanted to emulate. Never saw that anywhere, not with my mother, my grandmother, my girlfriends. The ways that I saw other women connecting with men, I I really felt was manipulative and, you know, it wasn't something I admired. So I couldn't even find an example of this. And so I had worked with Don Miguel, so I had the four agreements. I had, got, I had my master's in spiritual psychology, which is all about, you know, taking personal responsibility for yourself, using life as um, a mirror, you know, as getting information and growing and learning. And we're in the school of life. And so I started to apply those kinds of tools right? And I was in a 12-step program for a while for food. And so I took all of the things that I was learning that were generic and applied just to my life in general. And I started to apply all of these things to men, to my interactions with men. I looked at how I was taking things personally. I looked at where I wasn't being impeccable in my word where I wasn't keeping my side of the street clean. I looked at communication, how to ask for what I wanted and needed from men. And I was seizing, I wasn't just going on dates. I was really learning and growing. If somebody said something to me, you know, if a guy ghosted me, I didn't just sit back and feel badly or go, okay, his loss. I would write to that man. I would say I really enjoyed our time together. I'm not sure why you didn't, you know, decided that you didn't want to meet again, but I want to thank you and just tell you how lovely it was to meet you. So I learned how to start to take the high road and really be the change that I wanted to see. So I started to elevate myself no matter what other people were doing. How, how badly they behaved, if they lied on their profiles, if they didn't, whatever. I really had, you know, stayed above it all. And I, I was vibrating at a different frequency as I did this. And I started to attract higher and higher and higher quality men. Hi there, this is Talia. And I'd like to make a request. If this episode resonated with you and you found value in our conversation, could you show your support by hitting the subscribe or follow button? It's a simple way to let the platforms and us know you appreciate this content. By following the podcast, you'll ensure you'll never miss out on an episode and your support really means a lot to us. Thank you for being a part of our journey. I do like that, that even when people are behaving in a certain way, instead of getting upset about it, you be the person that you want to be anyway. And I think that I really admire that choice when we're hurt or when something comes up for us. It's easy to blame and give in. It takes a lot more courage to be the kind of person you want to be. And it's also, you know, I was saying to my husband one day, I took the high road with one of our clients who uh, was really impossible. She was just be she was impossible to please. And I just called her and I said, you know, I just want to refund your money. I said, I, you're not happy. 
you're not enjoying the program. And I'm, you know, I only want people in the program who value what we do. And if this isn't a fair exchange, I'd rather just give you your money back. And my husband said, well, you really took the high road. And I said, well, it kind of felt a little bit like a F you, you know, it it felt like a little bit like, I don't need your money. And he said, don't you know that taking the high road is always an an F F you like you're, yeah, a little bit, because it's like, you know what, you can do that, but you're not going to pull me down to your level. And it actually feels really good. You know, I don't think people really realize, like, you can want to get, get, get them back, but The best way is not to engage at all, just not to even let somebody pull you into their, you know, into that kind of low level interaction. It actually was kind of fun after a while. (laughs) You know, as you do this, Talia, you, you really start to see other people so clearly because you're just not willing to engage at that level anymore. It's actually quite fun. <laughs> I've never really thought of it as a nephew. That's really, I because I kind of think at that point, it's not really about them. It's about you and who you want to be. But um, interesting, interesting perspective. No, it's, I'll, can I tell you a great story? Sure. I have a, I have a theory that, you know, when you're dating, we often meet what's called an imposter. An imposter is sort of that last person, right? That last test before you meet the love of your life. And it's almost like they show up to see if they can pull you down like other guys have in the past to see if you'll be, you know, if you're still can be hooked. And so this guy turned out to be an imposter. And I got up in the middle of the night, I took my stuff, I went home, I was like, I don't need this, right? I'm not going to be with a guy like this. He was very emotionally disengaged. And the next morning, he called me on the phone. And he said, I wanted to talk to you before I ended this. Well, I left. He didn't mention that I was the one who left. He wanted to say, and I said, great, what did you want to tell me? And he started to hurl all these insults at me you're this and you're that and you're this and you're that. And I just sat there and listened. The old me would have been like, how dare you? Or you're a jerk. And, you know, and I just sat there and listened to him. And when he was all done, I just said, wow, you really don't like me. And he said, well, what are you going to do about this stuff? And I said, I'm going to hang up the phone. I said, I don't want to be in a relationship with someone who doesn't like me. When I hung up, I thought he's sitting there with all of his anger, you know, and whatever. And there's nothing worse than wanting to pick a fight with somebody who won't pick a fight with you. I felt like I had a huge mirror and I just flipped the mirror and put it right back in his face. (laughs) Did he did he say anything after the call? Was that it? Oh, he wrote me again and he gave me more stuff. Like he was going to get hook me. And I I deleted that email and then about 2 weeks later he wrote me and he said, "I always feel remorseful afterward." Wow. So he's done this yeah, before. I was say, not the first time. Right? And he said, "You know, stay on your path." And I wrote him back and I said, "Look, I got to tell you you really need help." And I said, being in a relationship with you was wretched. And I said, I really think there's something you need to look at here that you would behave that way with anybody. And that was it. He wrote me again after that and I just deleted it. I know we're running out of time, so I just want to get to this important question. Um, What does an emotionally naked dating mean? Have we touched on that without kind of labeling it yet? So emotionally naked dating is really taking your guard down, taking your walls off, dismantling that facade that we present to people to try to get them to love us or like us. It doesn't mean going on dates and just telling all your awful secrets. It does mean finding loving and kind ways to speak your truth in a way that a man can hear it. So if a man lets you down, you don't want to say, you know, you really disappointed me. I can't believe, you know, you, you, you fell asleep and didn't call me last night when you said you would. You want to say, 
hey, I know we all, you know, forget things. And I was waiting for your call last night. You know, is, did something happen that you want to share with me so that you create conversation and a space to talk about something, but you don't just not say anything. It also means, Talia, saying the hard things, the things that you're afraid to say. Right. right. Without the pointy edges, but also your your secrets, the things that you don't talk about, the things you're afraid to share. It doesn't mean you have to go to any human being, even the love of your life, and tell that person every deep, dark secret you have, unless it's something you really want to share with that person. Mm. But you also have to look at why you withhold or don't. You know, a lot of women we see go along in relationships. They're afraid to have commitment conversations. They're afraid to ask a man, you know, how are we doing? Where do you think this is going? Are you open to exploring a committed relationship? So many women just go along and they wait for the guys to bring those subjects up because they're afraid of the answers. So it's really being willing. I mean, my husband looked at me one day and he said, you know, I don't think there's anything I haven't told you. And he said, the only reason I haven't told you is because I may not have remembered or thought of it, you know, or thought to tell you, but not because he's hiding anything. Right. We don't, you know, we're just very loving and kind. I mean, it may boggle your clients, mind, you know, the, your listeners' minds to know We've never had a fight or an argument, not one in 20 in over 20 years. He is what I call the guardian of my soul. And in the midst of all of that, we're totally open and honest and we're best friends. Our relationship is passionate and playful. And our clients find relationships like ours. This is what we teach them how what to how to find. So we really know we've figured out the formula and how to actually teach women not just to find a partner, but to find what we call a guardian of your soul. Let's talk a little bit about the success you had with, with coaching your clients through this methodology. How long have you been coaching for and, and what does the program look like? So I pivoted about uh, seven years ago. I had been coaching since pretty much since I met Benjamin and I pivoted and I decided that I wanted to create, not, not do one-on-one -on -one sessions, but create a group course. And so I found a, a coach online who I loved and he's I've been with him for all these years and he helped me create my business model so the way our program works is it's we have a core course the core program that everybody has to go through and it is 12 weeks long there are one on some one-on-one -on -one sessions with your coach there are group sessions twice a week there's a daytime session and an evening session. Those are Q&A calls where you get on with all the other women. We answer questions and my husband and I do some of those calls. Our coaches, we have three coaches that work in our organization and they're phenomenal. They all went through the program and they all met their guardians of their souls through the work with us. So you're working with women who have already achieved this and being guided by them. And then there are eight weeks of guided videos and journaling exercises. And that is my personal process that I created that you go through. Part of that process is getting photos done. I was a professional fashion photographer for 15 years. And so I guide women on how to, we give them names of photographers that we've approved and I talk about what photos to get. And then um, we work with them to, uh, uh, we write, my husband writes their online dating profiles. Right, interesting. Hmm. And um, it is a game changer. Like really? those profiles, oh my God. Oh my God. Like we literally sit on those group Q&A calls all like every day, Talia. And the women are like, 
people, these men are saying that is the epic profile, the best thing I've ever read. You're whoever wrote, you know, you, you are amazing. I mean, those profiles elicit such an incredible response. It's, it's amazing. Okay. Before we wrap up, cause I know we're running out of time. What, um, what are some of the things that your husband includes on these profiles? <laughs> Ah, <laughs> I can tell you what he doesn't put in there. Great. Let's stop uh, there. <laughs> he doesn't put in, I, you know, I, I, I look forward to dancing in the kitchen. That comes out. References to foods come out. You know, you can say I love fine dining, but in a man's mind, if you start listing all the food, like I love chocolate and popcorn or you know, these are my favorite foods and all, all the man's mind immediately goes to this is what she looks like now. And this is what she's going to look like three years from now. So don't mention foods. Don't talk about dancing in the kitchen. Really stop and ask yourself, what are men looking for in a partner? What are the things that they really want to hear? What are you bringing to the table, right? I'm a wonderful listener. I'm a great conversationalist. I'm low drama. I know how to ask for the things I want. And I know how to take no for an answer. But he writes them in a very beautiful way. That is also his voice is quite poetic. He has just an incredible, you know, writing style. And um, men, just the right guys, really know that there's something, you know, it's like you could read a million blog posts and then read Ernest Hemingway, right? My husband's a really brilliant writer. He's written four books. Right. He's really good. Amazing. Okay. If anybody wants to know about Benjamin's profile, what they can do is go to my website, lisashield.com. And they, there is the perfect profiles. There's a tab and there's a sample profile on the, on the site. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll definitely be checking that out. Okay. So um, I, unfortunately we have come to the end, which I've got so many more questions for you, but if people want to find uh, out more about your program, how can they do that? Just go to lisashield.com, click the button all over the website to watch my free presentation and stay to the end of that presentation to book your breakthrough call. That's how you can get on a call with me or, you know, not with me, but with a with one of my members of my uh, my breakthrough call team. And they will exp explain everything. They will listen to you very carefully to see if you do fit the criteria that we're looking for in a client. It's very important that people know we don't work with everybody that comes along. We work with the women that we know we can help and who really are open and ready to get help. And if you are and we can help you, we'll talk to you about, about what that would look like. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lisa. I really yeah. appreciate your time today. And yeah, oh, best thank of luck you, with Talia. your program. <laughs> thank you. This podcast is a Rebel Love production. To find the links mentioned in this episode, go to rebellove.com forward slash let love begin.